This is a free preview of the full hour-long masterclass available exclusively on the PhysioTutors app. Check the link in the description. Welcome to PhysioTutors. Um, today, I present uh, this lecture to you on the diagnosis and the management of patients with esophageal radiculopathy. Now, what is a radiculopathy? What exactly are we talking about? Uh, let's start with that. And there is no unambiguous terminology or definition for cervical radiculopathy. If you look at the research, especially over the past four to five decades, you'll find a number of terms probably referring to the same condition. Things like a herniated disc, a pinched nerve root, American sports medicine will talk about a stinger, cervical brachial syndrome uh, is something you might find, slipped disc and other items all probably referring to that same thing, cervical radiculopathy. Initial treatment for a neuralgic MI trophy is uh, a pharmacological pain management. And as that pain subsides, patients might be referred back to you for exercise therapy to reduce, one, the regional interdependence overuse, and then re-strengthen the wasted muscles due to the neuropathic pain. The prognosis is relatively good despite its wasting and long-lasting effects. Most cases are resolved by the body's healing system in addition to specific strength retraining. Recovery of nerves and restoration of muscle strength will take several months to even a few years and many patients are left with uh, slight chronic symptoms of pain and fatigue in the affected shoulder and arm. If we try and classify patients with neck pain, one of the initial thoughts you're likely to have that most of the patients you'll see will have non-specific neck pain. Some 85 to 80, 95% of patients will have non-specific neck pain. A slight proportion will have specific neck pain, depending again on the type of clinic you work in. The non-specific neck pain are the grade 1 and grade 2, as the Neck Pain Task Force has suggested the profiles of grade 1 and grade 2 neck pain. Specific neck pain can be re-subdivided into a serious specific neck pain or a non-serious specific neck pain. And this classification system is similar to what Bollel proposed for the lumbar spine. The non-serious specific neck pain, the grade 3 neck pain, and the grade 4 serious specific neck pain. These are sort of general screening questions you would ask every patient, no matter what their complaint might be. The first four, night pain, significant unintended weight loss, history of cancer, and constant non-mechanical pain, sort of hint at the possibility of malignancies. Now, let's have a look at these. Night pain is then uh, defined as having so much pain that you are unable to fall asleep. And if finally, by complete exhaustion, you do fall asleep, that same pain will wake you up. That sort of night pain is a rat flag. It is a 10 out of 10 on a numerical pain rating scale constantly. A significant unintended weight loss, something like more than 20% of your body weight within four weeks, is something of a rat flag. A history of cancer is something we need to look at. If you haven't had cancer ever, then there is a pretest probability that your signs and symptoms might be because of a malignant process of about 0.7%. But once you have been through a period of cancer, if you've been diagnosed with cancer and you've managed to get rid of that, that pretest, post-test probability shifts to about 10%. Looking at it from a side point of view, if we were to look at the top left picture, here you'd see sort of a normal situation of a neural foramen, intervertebral discs, and that nerve root in the middle. It's got lots of space. And as on the right side, right top side, that disc height loses and gets smaller, of course, there is less space for that nerve root. If then also spondylotic changes appear in that same level, there's even less space for it. Disc herniations, lower left, will compress that nerve root, but continuing spondylotic changes as they grow on and on 
might eventually lead to nerve root compression as well. And one or both of those might finally result in that irritated, inflamed, compressed nerve root. And this picture is something to keep in mind when we treat patients, when we manage patients. Okay. Keep in mind that cervical radiculopathy pain is non-dermatomal in some 70% of cases. The old netodactic netodiagrams here are shown on the right, as we've all learned in physiotherapy academies. They look great and they hint at a potential for pain to be referred in a certain dermatome, but it's not as clear cut as this. The most often involved nerve roots are the C6 and C7 nerve root, almost two thirds of cases. So this will be the approximate area of radicular pain, but it's not, it's non-dermatomal. So the advice from that systematic reviews was to cluster the specific and the sensitive tests. Spurling, A test, which we'll cover shortly, the shoulder abduction relief test, and the combining of all your upper limb neural tension tests. Now, shoulder abduction relief test is a simple one. Patients put their arm above the head and they find a relief of symptoms. Sometimes patients will tell you that themselves in the history taking, which is a nice sign to have, but it's not often there. This is sort of an overview of what... Um, our assessment might look like in a patient with a cervical radiculopathy. <clears throat> Using the cervical range of motion device, the CROM, we have measured cervical rotation. As we can see, the rotation to the left is significantly less than so. From the right, it also provokes symptoms. Side flexion to the left is diminished and also provokes symptoms. And cervical extension is diminished as well. Now, we've also published a study on normative values for patients in each decade of life. So a normal rotation and site reflection should be laid against those normative values also. Sperling's test in this patient was positive. There was a difference in provocation of symptoms in the left to the right, in elbow extension. Combined upper limb neural tension tests were all positive. Shoulder abduction relief test was negative in this patient. Our reflex testing showed uh, that the triceps reflex on the one side was diminished as opposed to the other side. The sensitivity testing with monofilaments and two-point discrimination also showed a significant left to right difference. Neck pain was reported to be 6 out of 10 in arm pain and 8 out of 10 Pain education is a very important item. Start off with the message that a positive outcome is to be expected. It will take time, but it, most signs and symptoms will resolve. Have patients have a good understanding of a mechanism of cervical radiculopathy, of the compression of that nerve root, which motions, which movements, which postures provoke symptoms and why do they do that, and which relieve symptoms and why do they do that it assists them in their day-to-day -day management tell them about the compression the swelling the less room for the nerve root and the continued compression in certain postures a log fire analogy is a good one avoid flare-ups if they're at a stage that the most of the wooden log has burned down and we now only have glowing embers it's very useful to not add another wooden log to the fire because then the fire would flare up immediately and we need to take a longer period of time to have that flaming log of wood reduced to glowing embers. Have pictures available of a pinched nerve root either through disc herniation or foraminal stenosis due to spondylotic changes and how Vertebral movement, spine movement, cervical spine movement either compresses that nerve even more or reduces the pressure. Physical therapy in an early on stage, stage, look at offloading positions such as a slightly flexed away position of the cervical spine supporting the head with your hand against your chest. 
Have a look at if a cervical collar is useful in the first three to maximum of six weeks. Some gentle spinal manipulative therapy aimed at foramenal openers and some gentle neurodynamic mobilizations, sliders. Not putting extra tension on that nerve, but just having it move and slide to uh, activate that uh, intraneural flow and uh, reduce the intraneural edema. Laser pointer exercises like these are very useful in this time because the endurance of proper motor control is something that needs to be retrained. And at this stage, we also need to identify individual goals because one size does not fit all. And looking again at that ICF framework, that is something we as physical therapists work in. Now here again, we have that patient-specific functional scale which we mentioned earlier. And the 2.1 version, the updated version, uh, first asks patients to report their top three self-reported activities they feel they are unable to do or have difficulty in doing. But as we all are aware, many patients find it difficult to come up with a top three. And then that updated version of the patient-specific functional scale has a list of things which many patients with, for instance, a cervicodiculopathy have mentioned having difficulty with. And then patients can choose from that list. Individual rehabilitation, that patient-specific functional scale gives you a top three of the things they feel they are unable to do. And we can break those activities down into functional limitations and find the stronger and weaker links in the kinetic chain of those individual activities they feel they are still unable to do due to their cervical radiculopathy. I hope you found this an interesting masterclass. I hope you will forgive me the slight uh, hiccups in uh, terminology or in explanation or in words. Um, and I hope to see you again at Physio Tutors.